but I don't feel like particularly I got a lot of love at home. Mm-hmm. And I'll say now, uh, I haven't spoken to my mom in almost a year. What, what does it take to rekindle relationships? Even if it's not with parents, even with friends, how does it take to, um, I don't really know. I mean, I don't, I don't speak to my brother, um, since, uh, since COVID when I opened the gym, you know, I had a personal training client who killed himself. I had uh, two students here who, who wound up, um, back in rehab. One had been, uh, sober from alcohol for you know, six months, something like that. COVID shut us down. He started drinking again, wound up in a rehab facility in Florida. I had another uh, student of ours, um, sort of same deal, was training hard, was clean, was doing well. I ended up, you know, COVID lockdown, no community, relapsed on heroin, got an abscess in his arm, wound up in a coma. His mom called me, told me, you know, she didn't think he was going to make it out of the coma. Um, luckily, luckily, he did. He survived. I talked to him today. Um, but after losing one person and almost losing two people, I was like, man, I don't know anybody who's died from COVID. Not to say that that's not a thing, mm-hmm. but it was like, fuck this. We're like, I'm training. We're training. You know, your people need training. They need community. They need exercise. It was fucking bullshit. And, uh, my little brother thought that I was like killing old people by doing that. And, you know, so, so we don't talk, but, um, so I, I can't, I can't really speak to rekindling um relationships i think i mean it's hard when it's when it's your family but sometimes if your family's toxic man you gotta i think you gotta cut people out um if they're not good for you and and it's especially traumatic and and challenging if it's your family right because those are the people that are supposed to care for you and love you but eventually you get to pick your family you know you get to pick your friends and and uh pick the people that you surround yourself with and it's like I think it, you know, it, it may be more important to properly grieve the loss of those relationships than necessarily work to, to rekindle something for what that's worth, you know. Fair. Well, uh, I'm going to come up with a funnier quote to kind of bring us back up. Uh, I heard this quote from Craig Jones the other day. <laughs> Aim low, achieve. And... <laughs> He's, he's pretty well known for his quotes. And what um, <laughs> what can you say about achieving, achieving your goals, setting goals? Well, it's, I forget who said this quote, but success is achieved by moving from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. Mm. And it's like, I never reached any of the goals that I set for myself other than building and opening this gym. Wanted to be a state champion. I was a runner up. Wanted to be an NCAA champion. I was a qualifier. That was it. Uh, you know, wanted to be a straight force champion. Lost a split decision to, to KJ Haynes, who was you know, former champ. It's like, got real close to a lot of these things. Um, but it's the act of of trying, it's about setting goals. Like, um, I mean, I understand what, what Craig's saying, right? I went to uh, a Division three college rather than a D one college. You know, cause I wanted to be a national champion. I thought I had a better chance of, of doing it in D three than D one. You know, um, I had a, an NCAA champ, excuse me, on my team that I was going to be able to work uh, work with for a couple of years. Um, like as freshman and sophomore coming in with a guy. John, but uh, you know, it's 118 pounds, uh, two-time national champion, I think, from Ithaca, um, and so I, you know, I chose to go D3 to, to sort of be a, a bigger pit fish in a smaller pond, um, but, you know, I, th- I think it's just about continuing to set goals and continuing to strive and not allowing your failures to upset you, that's what, it's like, that same idea of, like, working for the sake of doing work and freeing yourself from the outcome like set the goals but when you when you don't hit those goals just set a new goal and keep trying you know it's like yeah i mean 
to me, trying is the secret sauce. Like your ability to try improves with each subsequent effort. You get better at trying. You can sustain your effort for longer with less lack of enthusiasm. And it's like the more you, you strengthen those skills of striving and trying, I think the more successful you're going to be. And it's not, it's not about like accomplishing these little goals on the way. It's about looking at your life as a whole. Like when you're young, it's really easy to get like short-sighted, right? Patience and time are the strong, strongest warriors. And then it's like, you put in enough time, it's going to happen. Like I've just, uh, I just bought some, some, uh, DJ equipment. I figure you know, I'm able to, to talk to and influence you know, a decent number of people here from the gym, but I've never been in a, a situation where it feels like somebody has a, a greater ability to reach out to a large group than in concerts. And so I figure, well, if, you know, if I focus myself and my efforts and my energy on, uh, on making music and, and DJing for the next 10 years, I've never tried to do something for 10 years that I didn't wind up pretty damn good at. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, okay, let's become a beginner where I know nothing. And all right, let's learn. It's frustrating and it's hard, but like, that's why you do it. If so it wasn't hard, it's not worth it. Right. So that's a completely fresh cap for you. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. I mean, I just realized there's, there's basically four places where I'm the happiest yoga, jujitsu, snowboarding, and the concerts. Mm -hmm. And three of those things are physical. I've had 20 orthopedic surgeries, so I don't know if you know, every day on the mats is a blessing. I'm very lucky that I can still train. I don't know how long that's going to last. Um, and so I figured I needed to find a creative outlet that didn't involve my body. And, and recognizing like the power of, of DJs and musicians, performers mm -hmm. to influence the consciousness of a, a large variety of people. So it's like probably the easiest way to change the world right does um the idea of walking away from all this scare you i mean i'm not walking away from it um well no, no, no. i mean like in the aspect of like you're talking about eventually not, not being, being able, able to train, train. right because yeah for me, that's that terrifies yeah. me yeah so young. yeah but i also like i believe in acknowledging the worst case scenario and and then working to prevent it like mm -hmm people who like don't want to imagine like anything ever bad happening when I got a fight I would watch footage I would see where the guy's most dangerous and I would accept like okay he head kick knocked out a lot of people with that red leg right. so that's a possibility now let's let's do everything we can to make sure that that doesn't happen but I feel like if you're not like coming to terms with loss death you know loss of use your body all of those things if you're not like really looking at that you're kind of living in a fantasy world because uh, eventually we all die eventually we all lose function so being appreciative and, and grateful for the time that you have on the mats and actively you know thinking about the fact that it doesn't last forever I think prepares you you know it's not like oh fuck now I can never train again it's like I know there's going to be that time and by, by meditating on it and working to come to terms with that before it actually happens, hopefully it makes that transition smoother when the time comes. Right. There's one, one thing I, I, was, I have another thing in here. I want to talk about manic behavior because it's going to tie back into this too. This morning I did the 6 a.m. class and I was working with Brock and not directly with him, but he was teaching mm -hmm. class. And he uh, was having us do the uh, uh, EBI overtime back take to the uh, uh, back take triangle. Back triangle. The yeah, back triangle. Uh, pretty and I, I didn't feel like I was doing it smooth enough. I, I, I don't know what it was. I don't, maybe it was early in the morning. Who knows? Didn't have enough caffeine what it was, but. I just didn't feel like I was doing it smooth enough. And sometimes it makes me so mad at myself that I want to cry. It, 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 it's almost like hateful and that upsets me. But what freaks me out or what worries me also is that 
when I got hurt in jujitsu and I tore the cartilage in my rib, I was out for like six months. I could barely even run or do anything. And I got in such a dark depression. And to be honest, there was moments where I don't know what I can say on YouTube, but I went really dark there for a while, man. And it was really hard to come to grips with the fact that I might not train for a while. And that was pretty minor compared to some of the stuff you've been through, but it was a really like hard uh, reality I came to with realizing I'm, I'm not um, a god. Yeah, I'm not invincible anymore. Yeah. That was the first major injury I'd had. And, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's all, it's all part of it. It's like, you know, if, if we aren't invincible, we're gonna, down here. Um, we're not invincible. It doesn't last forever. And, you know, I think, um, meditating on that and, and understanding that, that we're going to be gone, that we, we may return to dust is, valuable in helping you focus how you spend your time and energy while you're here. It's like, I've certainly become smarter in my roles. Um, I, I believe that I'm less prone to injury um, because of, of being aware of uh, weakness in the body and how things change, and, but just continuing to you know, do what you can. That sort of self hatred, I would, you know, like real harsh inner critic. But again, I would tell you that I don't think there's a single champion in, in the world that doesn't have that. Again, I would tell you that I don't think there's many champions that are happy when when they're training for that. And so it's like a balance. Like I remember, uh, I was struggling with mental health stuff in college, and eventually was medicated. And I went from you know, winning 20 matches as a freshman, getting on medication, and basically never doing anything again in my college career. I, you know, after college, I got off the medication and got in the MMA, and I was able to make another competitive run. But I went from, I think I was like 2014 as a freshman, NCAA qualifier, and just you know, got on these meds and basically lost my edge. And I felt like the meds took my fiber. It's like, okay, well, that fire made me want to kill myself sometimes. And I didn't kill myself, so that's a win. Right. But it was that fire. You know, I was using inner pain, turmoil, whatever, to fuel my training. That, I don't think that that's the only way to go about it. But I would say that if you look at Olympic champions, um, MMA champions, early childhood trauma, father committed suicide I think when she was in fifth grade Dan Gable's sister was raped and murdered in his family home like the number of people who obtain championship status um, who have dealt with severe trauma and that their total focus and dedication to their training is a trauma response those are the people that, that are champions you know, it's not it's not happy, well-adjusted, balanced people that reach the top. And I think he kind of, it's like, that was my goal for a long time. Now my goal is to be happy. So, you know, I was lifting a ton of weights after uh, you know, leading up to my hip surgery, going through my hip surgery. Um, got back into therapy, got back into doing more yoga. And I, and I haven't lifted in six weeks. Going to get back in there tomorrow. But realizing that the, the self-talk in the weight room, the way that I spoke to myself in my head in the weight room was so negative. I've never talked to anybody else like that. Like, come on, you fucking pussy. Let's go get one more rep, you little bitch. Like, right. all, like, and it's like, in yoga, I'm just like, breathe. I love myself. And it's like, well, I feel a whole lot better when I leave fucking yoga class and when I leave the gym, I leave the gym all angry. Right. And it's like, well, so maybe I just need to change, change the self-talk. See that that stuff's easier said than done. Recognizing it, recognizing one that that's not you. That self talk is not you. You're the one hearing that talk. That's a part of you that is trying to help you, trying to protect you. But it's not you. Your highest self 
understands that it's all love and that we're all one, right? And that the illusion of separation, the illusion of distance between people, every, you know, that that is all made up. But it's it's sometimes you know those those voices that drive you. So to to balance, you know, we talked about balance to find balance between being a champion and being happy. You know, I think I think that's uh, a life's work. You know, um, I, yeah, I, to uh, stick on the happiness thing, like one one thing that I really found happiness is in my dog. That was one thing that I really felt changed my life. When I got that dog, I cried. Like yeah. it was like I got a baby. Like yeah. it was it was intense, man. I I had never. I I had never been more responsible in my life. Like you got to go to work now. You got to yeah, maintain you got your to take care of. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. But um, to once again stick on the happiness thing. I used to be a very jealous person. Like I, I couldn't be happy for other people's successes. I couldn't. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Like, I was just like, man, I want that. Why does he get that? And it's oh, it's because he worked for it, you know. Mm-hmm. But. When I was, what, two years ago, so when I was 26, I was uh, training out in Boulder, and uh, I uh, had had the first moment in my life where I cried happiness for somebody else's achievement, Mm. and I'll tell you, man, the the amount of relief that I got from that, I I, I wish I could put words to it. It was Mm. was intense, but... One of uh, my teammates, her name was Sarah, she got her purple belt. And when they handed her that belt, and she cried, and I cried, and I was just like, like as a team, we were all just happy, yeah, yeah. like a community. It, it was beautiful. But I say that to ask you this. As a coach who is a, um, a, you're a, sec- or a second degree black belt, mm-hmm. right? As a person who's had countless hours on the mat, and people who have come up, left, people have stayed. When you hand somebody a black belt, or when you hand somebody a brown belt, or a purple belt, you know, those belts of the great divide. Mm-hmm. What does that feel like to you as a coach to be able to hand that to somebody? You know, I mean, it's, um, it's really just recognition of the work that they put in. You know, it, it feels good to, to acknowledge somebody's hard work. I always say the belt covers two inches of your ass. The rest is up to you. You know, I think it's, I think it's, you know, it's important to be recognized. But like, I think, like when you get your black belt, it really just frees you to become a beginner. It's like, you know, white belt, you're trying to survive. Blue belt, you're you're learning where a game, you're you know, you're learning what your go-to finishes are. Purple belt, you're learning chain your finishes, chain your attacks to set things up, brown belt, you're just refining that and adding pressure and then it's like once you're a black belt, it's like saying, you know how to learn. You you understand this game and so now take the skills that you've learned to get here and go back to, to zero. And it's like you know that's where I find sort of the most joy is in developing different aspects. It's like play the same game like when we talk about like a lack of ego in training it's like freeing yourself from the desire for victory putting the desire to learn above the desire for victory because it's like I can go out and, and wrestle get a takedown get a knee cut get to side control and dar somebody or north south choke somebody but, you know most people I can impose my will and learn a basic path but that doesn't like what does that do for me it doesn't do anything I already have that path right. so they're like okay I'm going to play spiral guard for a whole month I'm going to play quarter guard for a whole month I'm going to play you know these. I'm going to put myself in these positions and work out I'm going to do you know I'm going to allow myself to get into the honey hole and see if I can honey flip honey stick out like just freeing yourself from the results so that you can focus on the learning and black belt should be like look bro I can kill you if I want so now I'm gonna 
now I'm free to be a beginner again. Right. You know, it's like, you know, generally, like, my ego isn't non-existent, right? We all have ego. But it's like, I'll train for, you know, a month working on, on something, and then I'll come back one day and be like, all right, today I'm going to have some fun, and I'll impose my will. And then people will be like, damn, coach, what was I doing wrong? I was like... What happened today? It's like, dude, you're not doing anything wrong. I'm just not fucking around today. <laughs> like, you're doing fine, bro. I just was right. no longer playing the worst guard I have. Right. You know? um, yeah, I don't know how we got off. Yeah, right. No, I love it. I love it. Um, uh, <laughs> do you think? Do you think anybody can become a black belt? Is it literally just mat time, or do you think? And not even just like obviously like there's levels of black belts. Right? Sure. Do you think anybody can become a black belt in general, or do you think it takes a special, a special mind, almost? I mean, you just gotta not quit. You know? um, I mean, some people it may take twenty years. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just about showing up. It's like that's the beautiful thing about jujitsu. If you just show up, eventually it works. Like literally. I learned to finish an army guillotine last month. Yeah. I've been I've been grappling for forty years. I've been doing jujitsu for twenty one years. And I didn't have an army guillotine. So I'm like, oh I'm going to create this like it's like a back. And it's like I was oh what grip and how do I hold and it's like I just for whatever reason just quit. Didn't yeah, didn't have it and now it's like in, it's like, oh, boom, boom, and now I fucking kill everybody. Right. With it. And it's like, but it literally took me 20 years to learn it. And it wasn't like somebody said that. It was just like, right. it's like, it's like it's a video game, right? And it's like, you experience points, experience points, experience points, and it's like, do, 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 level <laughs> up. Right. And then it's like, oh, fuck, now I got a guillotine. Right. And it's like, but nobody tells you how many where your points are. Nobody tells you how many points you got to get. Right. You just got to keep showing up and adding points to the board. And then eventually it's like, do, 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 do. Right. And then you got something new. Right. You know, I, I had a moment like that the other day. I was, uh, not, it wasn't me personally. It was something I read, but it was a Tom DeBloss I don't, uh, mm-hmm. uh, post. I don't know if you follow him, but it was him responding to a kid who wanted to, one of his students beat. He was like, I don't understand what I did wrong, coach. Mm-hmm. And he was asking him about the underhook. I think he was in a uh, half guard or lockdown or something like that. Or something. Yeah, he might have got a darst or something. He's like, I don't understand. I had the underhook. And he's like, you don't understand. You have to, if your head's above his, he has the overhook. You don't have an underhook. And just that little bit has changed my game just in here, the little bit of live rolls I've had. Because, mm-hmm. like, I'll be sitting there, I'll be like, oh, wait. And I'll just bring my head above it. And then I, it's just the difference in control and just inches and yeah. game. And the thing is, like, you can hear that. Mm-hmm. And if you're not at the right point in your journey, right, it just goes over your head. And then you'll hear it again. And maybe it goes over your head. And then you train for a couple more years. And then you hear it. And it's like, oh, now I'm ready to hear it. And <laughs> right. then you can do it. Mm. You know, so like, I literally think it's like humbling yourself, taking the beginner's mindset, knowing that you can learn something from everybody, and just showing up. Just you know, it's like I just, you know, now I, I train three days a week with Rob at uh, Leverage in Louisville. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I go to high yoga ninety minutes in the morning Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I drive over to Leverage. I train for an hour. Um, and it's like, I'm just a student. I'm not teaching. I just show up. I do what they tell me. And then we go hard. And it's like, it's just, it, that's been such a blessing just to like, go back to being a student. Go back to just opening my mind, pretending I know nothing. Right. Thinking that they're showing. And you know, I think you just have to continue you know, getting this mindset. Everybody has something to teach me. Nothing is concrete. Don't like, don't hold on. So you have the techniques that work for you, awesome. But like, never allow yourself to become close-minded because everything's changing, everything's evolving. And it's like, yeah, I mean, the, the purpose is growth, right? And it's like, I'm not growing from the 
just to get some shit up. How do you constantly find things? Like, is just whatever you love, that's just what you're doing? Is that just kind of your life purpose now? No, I mean, I, I you mean as far as in jiu-jitsu? Or mm-hmm. just anything in general, because like you said, that you're doing music now. You like music. You kind of aim, you kind of aim towards things that you like. Is that all you look for? Or do you yeah, I mean, I basically like, like opening this, you know, opening this gym was my life's goal, and then I did it, and I, it's here, and it's you know, kind of runs itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I said, well, okay, if anything was possible, what what could I imagine? What would be the best? job the best circumstance that I could possibly imagine and you know, my goal is to change the world <laughs> as, as crazy as that sounds um, and I just didn't see a place other than music music venues you got one guy speaking to thousands and thousands of people you know the DJ says bro introduce yourself to your neighbor give him a hug tell him you appreciate it people do that shit mm-hmm. and it's like I just, it just seems like the, the, the easiest way to have the largest influence. Um, and, and, you know, people are struggling and they need support, they need guidance, they need, they need leadership, they need community, they need their tribe. You know, it's like, it's a lot, there's a lot of forces at work trying to weaken um, the population, I believe. Right. Fight back with strength. And I think the, you know, I'll have maybe 20 people, 30 people in my class tonight, and those people will you know, get a get some knowledge in jujitsu, and, and you know, hopefully get a quote that motivates them or, or does some form at the end. But my influence here is relatively small, and so I said, how can I have the biggest influence? And I always liked music. I had a, a music teacher in second grade told me I couldn't sing, kind of. So I kind of. Shut me, shut down. What's crazy is I got needs improvement in uh, gym mm-hmm. and music. <laughs> and I went on to become a pro athlete, <laughs> so now I'm gonna go on to become a fucking musician. So fuck them. That's you awesome. You know, it's like I got good grades and everything, but those two things. It's like the universe trying to fucking, right. you know, trying to shut that down because that's where I'm gonna be the most powerful. And right. so just recently recognizing, like, dude, you, like everybody can sing. Need voice lessons, need to learn, need to practice, but it's like, fuck that. Nobody can tell me what I can do. Fuck you, right? Right. you know. And and if I fall short, who cares? It's about trying. It's like I'm learning. I'm putting myself out there. You know, it's like you know, gotta gotta continue to strive. Gotta continue to grow in progress. So I just said, what what would I be happiest doing? What where could I have the greatest influence in the world? And what time are you looking at? Uh, five fifty-three right now. Yeah, yeah, I got to out for class. Sure. I appreciate you, dude. Yeah. This is really fun. Cool. I hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah, certainly. But Sorry about that. No, no, dude. Communication. No, not at all.